Matthew, thank you very much for that very clear and, I thought, heartfelt presentation. So let's just take a breath here. Uh, Matthew uh, has given us a, a little bit of history about standards, the rationale for standards. He's spoken about the, the consultation process, this very extensive consultation process that took place, and has told us that, um, that the consultants, the people that did it, uh, had a very high level of confidence that their methodology was robust and what they were saying was uh, re reflected a reality out there. So we've got that. We, the, um, we have some conclusions from that process about the awareness of standards, the implementation of standards, the lack of systematic presence, and so on. And very importantly, we have these new recommendations that are now coming out of the, uh, uh, of the, of the process. And some of these look pretty significant to me uh, around a, something called a, a core humanitarian standard uh, with benchmarks and indicators, which is a significant thing. Verification, uh, which we'll hear a little bit more about in a minute. Uh, something about the dissemination of this core standards. And something, a phrase I hadn't heard before, st standards architecture, which we might want to uh, talk about later. But before we go on to Philip, I mean, listening to, to you, Matthew, I, many of the things you said I wasn't surprised about, but some of them I were a little bit surprised about. It's the first time I've heard this. Um, and I wonder if we could just take two minutes to ask our participants here to think about one thing that you found surprising about what Matthew said and one thing that wasn't surprising. Um, that would be quite interesting for me to hear. We'll make a note of it and feed it back into our discussion. But is there anyone that would like to offer one thing that was surprising to them about what Matthew has told them and one thing that wasn't surprising? Would anyone like to do that? One surprising thing? Please. Can you just say, sorry, um, we'll give you the microphone. And could you just say who you are, <laughs> uh, and if you if you are doing something, uh, please tell us what it is. Yes, uh, <laughs> Thank my you. Name is Kate Willis. Can you hear me from the Fair Trade Foundation? Can we hear Kate? All right, we Product can. Product integrity officer. Yeah. Um, I was surprised to hear that you have over a, a hundred standards mm. in existence now. Yeah. That was quite a, an eye opener yeah. to me. And me. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that wasn't surprising, Kate? Um. I think you've done a, a, a good, thorough job in, in approaching 350 organisations to ask to, for, for consultation. I think that's bravo. Thank you. Good. We're going to hold that one. You, you, that, was, that was a surprise to me. Over 100 standards. We might come back to that later in the discussion. Anybody else hear something that surprised them? No? N anyone here? Something that didn't surprise them? Good. All right. We, we, shall, we shall move on. Uh, we're going to now move on to certification. Um, and I'm going to introduce you to Philip Zeminga, who's sitting on my left. He's now leading the certification review project for the SCHR. Um, previous to that, for five years, he was head of DARA's Humanitarian Response Index, which I'm sure you all know. And before that, he was head of evaluation at the International Federation of the Red Cross. He's also worked for the Canadian Red Cross in the Hurricane Mitch response and has 20 years experience overall ranging from US peacekeeping missions in Central America right up to what he's doing at the moment. So Philip, are you going to tell us about certification? Yeah, you didn't say US peacekeeping missions, did you? <laughs> no, UN. I beg your pardon. <laughs> what a yeah, that was exactly the problem. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that was surprising. Well, we all Thank knew you. at the time that who we were really working for. No. Uh, um, <laughs> yes, I stand corrected. I do apologise. That was my fault for <laughs> poor handwriting as I passed it yes, to John. It does look like thank it you, is. John, and uh, thank you for Elnat for organising this. Um, I'm, I'm speaking today um, uh, as the, the project coordinator of the SCHR certification review project. So just to make clear, I'm going to share with you kind of my personal reflections of the project so far, uh, some of the um, ideas that are coming out of it, uh, and, and um, uh, the kind of reflections on where we're, we need to go on this. 
My first question might be to, to you. Uh, of the organizations here, how many of you are uh, members of or participate in uh, any type of certification type of process, whether it's HAP or part of perhaps uh, here in the UK, uh, like DEC or others like that? Can you raise your hands if you're involved in any of those? Okay. How many of you have um, funding from DFID, for example? No? So there's, uh, you you part of I guess uh, if you're here in the UK, uh, you you must follow national legislation around charities. Uh, maybe you've gone on some kind of charity rating um, or, or evaluation um, uh, program as well. My point is that certification, whether it's called explicitly certification or not, is around us every day. It's a reality. Uh, and from humanitarian organizations' perspective, um, it's becoming an increasingly complicated reality, trying to navigate um, the requirements and restrictions and um, procedures that we all uh, have to, to go through to do our work. Uh, and then on top of it, we have our convictions as humanitarian organizations, things that we have um, value in about the, the need for reaffirming humanitarian principles, about being accountable to affected populations. And the 100-plus uh, initiatives in the sector currently that we're all trying to grapple with and all trying to get us towards the same point. How can we do our job better? How can we be more effective at meeting the needs of, of, of people who are in the face of a crisis? So certification is around us. As I said, it's not necessarily called that. It has different forms and guises. But it's all part of um, the reality that we're working with. And the whole point behind this project is uh, after 20 years or so of talking about and developing uh, different standards and different initiatives, uh, SEHR felt it was a moment to take stock of where we've got to and to think and explore well, what is what does certification mean and how could it really add value to our work? So it is exploration. And uh, Matthew talked about where some of these um, initiatives come from, from Rwanda, the Balkans. And we've heard about um, uh, out of the tsunami, the need for greater coherence and harmonization. And my first reflection is that much of these, or many of these initiatives, come out of our sense of collective responsibility that we failed in achieving our objectives, that we failed in living up to our um, commitments and our, and our values. And, it's, and I think it's a natural response, it's a reactive response, uh, and it's an attempt to recognize that we could do better. This project doesn't have mm, a major crisis that's kind of wrenching us uh, our hearts and thinking, why have we couldn't failed again? So we're not dealing with that. We have an opportunity, I think, with this project to be proactive and to think, where's the sector going? Where are humanitarian uh, community evolving to? How are needs evolving? And how could we um, become better prepared for that? And then specifically, what could the role of certification uh, be to help us along that path? <coughs> to make sure that we're living up to our own expectations of, of um, how we work and the expectations of others that uh, we work with. So it's, a, it's an opportunity to reflect, to explore, and to think about what the potential role of certification is, where does it fit in uh, our current approaches, and where it could, it could be in the next uh, five or ten years. A couple of things about the process itself. I mean, the Joint Standards Initiative is uh, something that the SCHR has been kind of actively supporting and engaging in. And I had the, the privilege of, of also working closely with uh, the JSI's advisory group. Uh, and I do think it's a really important and, and interesting moment in time. Um, it's a, a where we have an opportunity to find greater coherence and harmonization and perhaps make some better sense of all these different... Um, uh, initiatives out there and, and how we could use them more effectively. That process is coming to a close. 
And in a way, the SAHR certification process is really beginning to scale up our own research and consultation um, agenda to find out the answers to uh, that, this question. I is it time for the sector uh, to consider a system-wide approach to certification, to looking at what are the core requirements to define and determine if an organization is credible, reliable, trustworthy, effective, and accountable at meeting the needs of affected communities. Um, if, if that is the case, and if certification can help us further along that uh, line of travel, then what would it take to build a model that is successful, effective, sustainable? And how, how would we get there as a sector? So these are kind of the exploration questions that we're posing with this uh, project. And it comes out of that, I think, a realization, um, just as the, the organizations uh, involved in the Joint Standards Initiative, a kind of a realization that we've made lots of progress, but we haven't got nearly as far as we, I think, collectively would like to be. And if you look at um, the use of uh, technical standards like Sphere or any of the other kind of related programming uh, standards, lots of people have signed up for them. Lots of people have um, got trained on them, but not a lot of organizations are actually reporting back about how that's had an impact in their work. Uh, just like uh, HAP, if you're uh, in involved in HAP, lots of organizations have signed up for HAP, they're members of HAP, but very few of them have actually gone through the whole process of becoming a HAP certified organization. Um, and, and we want to know and understand why that is. And what would it take to get us a little bit further along uh, to, to what we would call a sustainable, effective um, approach to, uh, to certification? So how are we going to go about doing that? Well, we have a couple of lines of inquiry. The first is, um, and obviously the most important part, is engaging with different stakeholders in the sector. And that means people like you here in this room, those of you uh, online watching us uh, today, uh, to understand from your perspectives what um, certification could offer you, what your concerns are, what the risks are, <coughs> what the limitations are, but um, more importantly, defining what success would look like and how it would impact on your work and make your life, uh, uh, your work more <coughs> effective. So consultation is critical. And like the JSI process, we want to reach out to as many different actors as possible, particularly smaller um, NGOs, southern NGOs, um, ones who have not typically been engaged in many of these debates and conversations over the last 20 years about what we consider quality and accountability. So it's really critically important that we get the, these perspectives into our, um, into our analysis. We also want to hear from other stakeholders that we, as a sector, as a community, haven't really spent a lot of time talking to. That would include, for example, the role of donor governments, the ones who are, by and large, financing a lot of the work that we do. Uh, what are their expectations? Uh, what are their um, uh, expectations of humanitarian actors? What are the tools and processes they use to assess and uh, evaluate humanitarian actors? Um, and could certification resolve some of the requirements or issues or concerns that they have as donors? Maybe yes, maybe not. We don't know that answer. And it's important, though, that we engage with them in this conversation so that we can understand how this uh, could potentially add value to other <coughs> stakeholders as well. Host governments. We see more and more capacity uh, around the world where governments are uh, becoming more assertive about how they want to engage with aid actors. They are becoming more demanding about what they want uh, from us. Um, some in some cases, they're developing uh, regulatory frameworks or legislation or procedures uh, about how they will uh, guide and orient the relationships that they have with, with uh, humanitarian actors. That's really important for us to take into consideration when we think about certification. Could this offer uh, host governments 
um, some ways and means of identifying and understanding who is, again, a credible, reliable uh, partner to work with and who's going to more effectively uh, work with them and local authorities and, and communities to uh, address the needs in a time of crisis. And perhaps uh, the one really important piece of, of stakeholder consultation that we really are very, very interested in doing is what does this actually mean for affected communities themselves? What do they want and expect from us as humanitarian uh, actors? And could certification potentially give them a sense that we're living up to their expectations and we're meeting the, their needs and, and priorities? So understanding that from their perspectives and, and seeing um, how this might um, more consistently and reliably demonstrate to affected populations that we're living up to our commitments, that we are committed to being effective and we're committed to being accountable to them. And that's another area of work that we're, we're, we're interested in exploring. So with consultation and some specific pieces of work, some studies and scoping exercises that we're going to do, and the whole um, result of that is that we hope to start to be making some concrete proposals about what we think a successful model might look like, how it would work, uh, what kind of impact it would have on organizations' day-to-day -day work, and how this would uh, add value uh, and deliver better results for affected communities. Let me share some of the kind of responses that we've got already and are very kind of preliminary stages of consultations and, and conversations with uh, these different stakeholders. Uh, first, there's a lot of skepticism on the one hand from a significant number of organizations, humanitarian organizations who think, um, yeah, yet again, another initiative that's going to create yet another layer of bureaucracy and process for us. And that's a really important and legitimate concern. People are telling us, well, that's you know, great, but you know, we don't want uh, something that's going to add burden and more costs and it's going to um, um, you know, make our life more complicated, particularly at the field level. Uh, and that's really important uh, to, to listen to those concerns. People are also concerned about, we don't want a, a, a process where you're going to, through certification, say who can work in here and who can't work in here. Uh, we don't want a system that perpetuates the power dynamics and, and equities in the current system. Uh, which is very northern uh, and western biased. Uh, we want a system that's open, um, that is flexible and allows us, um, as a, a, if it's a smaller organization or a southern organization, to participate as equal partners in that. Uh, we want, um, and this is similar to, to the JSI consultation process, we don't want something that kind of says black or white, yes or no. Uh, we want something that actually recognizes the diversity of capacities and experiences in the sector and acknowledges that. So a system that is able to tell, uh, to say, uh, this is an organization that meets some minimum requirements um, and, and has some potential to provide effective and accountable aid. And it's important to make that acknowledgement at the same time of saying, here's a line of travel. Here's what excellence might look like so that or any organization can inspire to work towards uh, excellence. And we don't have a simple you know, yes or no type of, of model where we say you're credible and you're reliable and you're not. Those are some of the concerns. Um, but we also hear from a very significant amount of organizations who are quite interested about certification and excited about certification, about the potential benefits and the opportunities that it presents to us. A lot of uh, organizations have, uh, I think, and this is again very similar to the JSI consultation, uh, said, you know, our informal self-reporting approaches to standards and uh, commitments and humanitarian principles it just isn't enough anymore. We need more rigor. We need a more robust way of 
demonstrating to ourselves and to our stakeholders uh, how we are applying these standards and to provide some measurable evidence uh, about how we're doing that. And so there are uh, a, quite a number of organizations who are ex enthused and excited about the potential of certification, about building a, a harmonized framework around uh, more consistent, more reliable um, monitoring, verification, and reporting back on about how standards are being used and using that as an evidence to build uh, more trust and credibility mm, about uh, impact that we're having. There are some who see this as an opportunity of uh, protecting uh, humanitarian space in the sense of saying, by establishing some minimum requ requirements or some minimum criteria about what characterizes or defines a humanitarian organization, from other organizations like private sector contractors or the military who claim to be doing humanitarian work, well, your certification might be a way of establishing some common language around what is required <coughs> to be considered humanitarian or not. So some are looking at this as an opportunity, uh, a risk management tool, if you will, uh, and a way of distinguishing uh, from a very uh, often comp um, very competitive field uh, others who don't necessarily share the same convictions and commitments to humanitarian principles and values that we have. Uh, some of it, some of the people we've been talking to are quite interested in uh, seeing this as a way to not only help them improve with their own internal processes by setting out a roadmap of, of uh, what uh, good practice looks like, uh, but also uh, as a way potentially of um, providing more benefits, access to more funding, or better relationships and, and potentially access to affected populations um, because of the credibility that certification could give in, uh, in light of a, a host government. So our challenge here is to try to understand those different points of views and try to come up with a consensus about you know, what are the potential benefits of this, what are the risks and limitations of this, and, and then how could we uh, move it forward? Encouragingly, though, I do think that a consensus uh, will emerge out of this. As we become and engage with more and more people and begin to do more and more detailed work about what this would, could entail, different op options and different models, um, I think we'll be able to have a much more informed discussion and debate about what certification could offer us. Uh, and. Um, help move us forward as a sector uh, towards con defining collectively uh, what model would work to meet our needs and help us uh, to consider where the needs in the future are going to be and how this might um, uh, help us collectively to be more consistent, more reliable, more coherent uh, as a sector. And maybe just a few um, um, points about what people are telling us about what we should be looking at. What would we um, assess an organization against? And yes, there's a lot of criteria, and I'm very happy to hear that JSI wants to, the, the organizations uh, involved in JSI want to share with us. We equally want to share what we've been hearing about the things that are important in our consultations about what do you ass assess against. But the two single most important things that come out of all of our consultations so far are a real uh, universal consensus. And this is whether we're talking to host governments and donors or humanitarian organizations, large or small, is a sense that we have got to find a way of reinforcing humanitarian principles, not in a way that we just wave them on a piece of paper and say we agree with them when we apply them, but we can demonstrate in measurable, verifiable ways <coughs> how those principles are put into practice in our day-to-day -day work, particularly at the field level. And that's um, one area of, of consensus already, and I'm really, really pleased to hear that. Uh, the challenge, of course, then, is to try to come up with ways of operationalizing that and measuring that and building that into a way, uh, a, a means of monitoring, verifying, and reporting back on how organizations are doing that. Um, 
And, but, but there's an opportunity finally to say, you know, humanitarian principles that we all espouse to, how do we actually show that they're being applied in, in practice? And the other one that's really, I think, encouraging and reflects a huge consensus, and again, with all of the different stakeholder groups we've talked to, is how do we put people, people affected by crisis, at the center of, of any potential certification model? And this is, again, a huge challenge. We all talk about this. It's all in all of our policy documents and our communications material and how we present ourselves. Or is there a systematic way that we can demonstrate that collectively and individually we're meeting the needs and expectations and concerns of affected communities? Our, our hope is through the, this project we can actually come up with um, and build on some of the very exciting work that's happening around accountability of affected populations and come up with some proposals about how we could systematically incorporate that into any potential monitoring, verification, reporting mechanism, whether it is a formal certification process or not. Because that's going to be, I think, the credibility, the key to our credibility as a sector today and in the future, is being able to provide evidence of that in a, in a systematic way, not anecdotal way, not piecemeal, uh, not through uh, a program evaluation here or a project one over there, but something that pulls it together in a more consistent and coherent uh, manner. So those are the types of things that we're, we're looking at. Uh, and again, we're going to be depending on the knowledge, the insights, the experience, the um, enthusiasm, but also tempered reality and pragmatism of, of uh, people like you and your colleagues in other organizations about how to make that a practical um, uh, process. So looking forward, uh, over the, we have this um, humanitarian standards um, forum coming up at the end of June. Uh, we will be hearing from the conclusions of the Joint Standards Initiative and at that time we'll also have a day to talk about where we've got to in our thinking around certification, where our findings are, and we'll propose a few um, concrete models that we would like then to share out with the community to see is this going to work or not and how would it work and how would it add value so that we can continue this dialogue over the next year and a half, two years and, and build some, uh, some consensus around uh, answering those questions. Is, there, is it time for certification? How could it add value? Is it feasible? And what would it take to make it successful and sustainable for the sector? So an out overview, but really the questions are open uh, I don't have all the answers and I'm just as interested in hearing about your thoughts and reflections mm -hmm. as we move forward with this <coughs> process as well. Thank you. Philip, thank you very much for that uh, thoughtful and measured uh, presentation. Um, I, I, I'm writing thinking that unlike the JSI, who are just coming to the conclusion of their, of their consultation process, you sounds like you're sort of halfway through. Can, could you give, just tell us about the time frame here? Because what we have at the moment is... Uh, we know there's a consultation process happening. You've outlined some concerns. Yep. Um, you've outlined also that there is some enthusiasm in certain quarters, and there are at least two points of consensus. And you're looking towards presenting some kind of model or models, options, model, options for models for the future. Yeah. So where are you on, yeah, on that we, road? We started the process in October. Um, and again, we work very closely with the JSI process to try to avoid, as Matthew said, this duplication and going out to people constantly asking them the same question phrased in different ways. Um, we're, we're, um, so our consultation process has been kind of much more kind of measured and quiet. Um, based on that and the kind of research we're doing from June to the end of, of this year, we would hope to come up with some um, concrete a limited number of concrete kind of models that people can touch and feel and, and, and look at. What does this actually mean for me? And do some uh, kind of piloting and case studies um, of, of uh, uh, a few organizations, larger INGOs, smaller um, national level NGOs, to see you know, what that would mean for them if we went down this route and that route or that route. Um, so from here to the end of, of this year, kind of coming up with some um, potential models and criteria to look at. 
uh, and then from uh, uh, January on to October of next year, refining that, um, testing and validating it with a, um, a wider consultation process, reaching out in particular to um, uh, to southern actors and to those different stakeholder groups like host governments and donors to make sure that we're, we're trying to kind of cover as many of their bases as possible. Philip, thank you. Thank you very much. Um,